Continuing on this episode of Law Weekly, we look closer at the recently passed Petroleum Industry Act and some of its implications for the country. We have the views of Dayo Kusami, an oil and gas expert and a partner in one of the country's leading law firms. Also showing on this episode of the program, River State signs five bills into law. For a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Trieli. After so many starts and stops, the Petroleum Industry Bill has finally become law. On Monday, the 16th of August, President Muhammad Buhari signed into law the bill, which many say marks a significant milestone for Nigeria's oil and gas industry. Indeed, the Petroleum Industry Act, PIA, is coming more than 50 years after the last legislation, which had become obsolete. So much has been said about the implications of this legislation for the country and its people. But on the show today, I'll give you a fresh perspective. My guest, Dayo Kusami, qualified as a lawyer in 2001. He became partner energy and projects at the law firm Templars in 2009. In 2011, he joined the corporate world as group general counsel and company secretary of Atlantic Energy, an upstream oil and gas company where he worked out of offices in Lagos, Zurich, and London. In 2015, he went on to serve as an executive director with an indigenous oil service company, providing marine logistics support to energy companies in Nigeria and the wider West African region. And in 2019, he rejoined Templars and has built a sterling reputation as one of Nigeria's leading oil and gas lawyers. I started the interview by getting his comments on the PIA as passed and the committee set up to implement the law. Well, I, I think the fact that it's been passed is progress. It's taken a long time and it's finally here. And I usually say it's better a bad law than no law, because whatever faults there are, we can improve with regulation and amendments. But it's here, so it's given certainty to the industry. That's the most important thing. Regarding the implementation committee, I think it's a smart idea because often the case is that you have a law passed and there is a transition period with no one actually guiding the boat. So the fact that you have a transition committee that will be, I assume, staffed with those who have industry expertise and knowledge, I think it shows the political will to not just pass it, but get it through and implement it properly. So we would expect uh, industry experts from the government, from NNPC, DPR, the regulators. I think it would also be helpful if we had, uh, and I'm not putting myself up for it, but lawyers as well, and people in private as well, who can liaise and interact with the government so you're having a holistic and realistic uh, implementation of the PIA. What for you are the highlights of this law as passed? What are the key things that maybe excite you? You know, it's been a long time coming. It's been, it's been a very long time coming. The first time I reviewed a draft of the PIB as it then was, was 16 years ago. And for a while I said it would never happen. So again, the fact that it's passed, fantastic. Details, the gas, right? You've probably heard it before we say it, uh, but Nigeria is not an oil company, it's a gas. We're literally sitting on an ocean of gas. And the PIA has a number of fiscal incentives, including the tax-free period that you can get of up to 10 years. Fiscal. Fiscal regime, yeah. Okay. So um, you could get tax-free uh, incent fiscal incentives, a tax-free period. Um, there are utilization uh, benefits that are embedded in the PIA. That, for me, is one of the most uh, exciting things because that is what can kickstart uh, a proper development of our gas industry. One of the topical areas that's been up for debate is these um, oil companies, major oil companies are complaining about taxes and royalties and then the pushback against the right percentage due to host communities. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? So there are two different things. Let's start with the host communities, right? Um, it's become a political issue because as you know, uh, the PIA, uh, assuming that what has actually what will be gazetted is what we saw as the final version, it gives 3% to the host communities. Which There's some people have argued is not enough. Correct. And some might say it's too much. So that's where it becomes a political thing. I don't think it goes down to the quantum. Okay. It's how it's managed. Um, if you recall, the NDDC collects 3% of all oil companies' operating expenditure, right? But there have been questions as, has it been appropriately utilized? Okay. So if you had 10%, 
and it's not properly utilized and you have three percent that was properly managed and utilized i'd rather have the three percent okay. so i feel that people might always want more but i think the focus uh, should be on proper utilization to give you an example the gmd of nmpc said if you use last year's operating expenditure uh, of oil companies what that three percent translates to is 500 million dollars wow. a year now if you had 500 million dollars a year invested in host communities properly managed and distributed you would see a remarkable remarkable difference mm -hmm. so that for me it's more how it's applied um to the first question regarding taxes um i'm a corporate lawyer and i could tell you i don't like taxes Companies don't like taxes, but there's that old saying, the only thing certain is death and taxes. So a company, while I'm sympathetic to the fact that they should not be overly taxed, uh, if you're operating in a high value environment, taxes must be paid. The important thing is um, they must be streamlined, open, transparent, and they must be applied properly. Um, so if going back to my point of gas utilization, the tax rate has actually been reduced, right? If you look at uh, on crude oil operations, they've introduced a hydrocarbon tax, which in addition to CETA, if you add both of them, is actually less than the current regime now. So while the government take home, I recognize in some instances can be higher, in most cases, the taxes themselves have been reduced. There's also this um, issue of state governors threatening to go to court, alleging that the PIA violated the principle of separation of powers. I, I'm sure you've heard about about that. They argue that the act will deny the states their fair share from the Federation. Right. What do you make of all of those arguments? I feel that um, there will be a number of challenges and interpretations of the PIA. You, there is not one law anywhere in the world that everyone is happy about and a number of them will be challenged. Right. A number of them, I think people forget that a number of laws come out and regulations are issued afterwards to clarify different points. But to your specific question, Every single governor um, has a responsibility to be able to get as much revenue as That's they can for their own state. So I understand their position, but it needs to be balanced with the whole national good as well. I'm not really in a position because each governor says the different things, but it goes back to the argument of uh, derivation and littoral states. You really should, and I believe that personally, uh, if not professionally, that um, the the communities where we do get the crude oil and gas from should be amongst the most developed in, in the country. And where that is not the case, I think that's a travesty of justice. So I can understand it from that point of view. But if everyone says, if everyone got what they wanted, no one would get every, anything at all. So you would say, shit your swords, don't go to court yet. Let's see how it plays out. I would say, let's see how it plays out. Um, there is only a limited amount of money. But here's the thing. If the PIA does what I think it will do, right, the revenues are going to go up so high that that so-called small piece would be a small piece of a larger pie. So you have a situation where, whereas the governors could be complaining that, oh, we're only getting $100 under the PIA. If the PIA spurs investment and that triples, then do they really have a cause to complain? I would argue not. I know that there are a lot of registers that I am not familiar with. Right. There's this one I heard about fossil fuel. Yes, and fossil that the fuel. world is moving away from it. Correct. And so some people say that this PIB perhaps is coming too late. Well, better late than never. And um, sure, it should have been passed uh, 10 years ago. But what if it wasn't passed 10 years from now? I think um, cynics say that uh, it should have been passed. Um, optimists say, well, it has been passed. Fossil fuels, like I said, the PIB has extensive, significant provisions for just gas utilization. So while gas could be deemed a derivative because you have associated and non-associated gas of fossil fuel, it's not a pure play fossil fuel. Crude oil is, right? So gas is cleaner energy and there are arguably more provisions and incentives for gas utilization than crude oil. So I would disagree with those that say it's fossil fuel focused uh, because it's actually forward looking. The PIA is actually a forward looking uh, legislation. I, is, thank you. Yeah. So, so having, having looked at the act, yeah. there, have you identified any gaps? Oh, so well, let, <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you something. It's, it's, it's the easiest thing to do is to criticize, well, right? Yeah. So I will tell you this based on um, we've done maybe five, 10 reviews in the last month for different clients. Before Obviously, it was passed. Before it was passed. Yeah. Because we sent out a client note. We like to keep our clients up to date with something we call the Templars Legislative Watch, right? We tell them this is a law, 
this is when we expect it to come out. So we sent out a note saying, in our opinion, the PIB is going to come out summer of 2021, which generated interest. And they said, okay, how is it going to affect our business? Now, what would be a gap for a midstream, upstream or downstream are entirely different. There are gaps, but I tell you what, uh, the Petroleum Act, 60 years old, had gaps, right? The most current upstream uh, Petroleum Act in the UK, the US, Australia, still has gaps. There will be gaps, and some of them will be clarified or rectified with legislation. That is the normal legislative process. So for so me, as the yeah. more we use it, the more, the we're more we fine use tune it, it, the more we study it, mm. the more we look at how it is practically implemented. So in the PIA, there's a provision that 30% of the NNPC profit be allocated to develop the development of frontier basins, and that has generated a lot of controversy. What do you make of that? Um, it has, uh, because I think that there might be um, a misunderstanding of what frontier basins are. Um, the general consensus when I read the paper that I take away is that people think that this money is being allocated for exploration of oil and gas in the north where there is no oil and gas. So what is going on um, as opposed to the south? Now, uh, factually speaking, um, the, there are a number of frontier areas or frontier basins. I can tell you for a fact that Anambra has a frontier basin, right? There could be a frontier basin um, in Ondo State. There is one in Sokoto. So you so have even states that do not have oil. Correct. Have yes, basin. they can have because what you have, Nigeria has um, over 600 million TCF of gas, right? We've only discovered one third of that, about 200 TCF. So um, uh, a, a lawyer I admire had said something. He said, Nigeria is sitting on an ocean of gas. So there is still stupendous amounts of natural gas that has not been discovered. If you don't explore, you will never find. So a frontier area is that which has not been explored. Yes, a number of them are in the north, but a number of them are also in the south as well. So what this provision is saying is, is actually a kind of reinvestment. Because NMPC, which will become NMPC Limited, uh, is making provisions. There are also provisions for retain, retained uh, profits, uh, operating expenses, and then uh, remitting the rest to the government. So I think if there's an understanding of what a frontier area is and knowing that it's not just in the north of the country, uh, it might assuage some concern that people have. There's the issue of the commercialization of NNPC. That's something that you've alluded to. How's that going to work? Um, so the PIA provides that you will incorporate so NMPC is going to become a private company registered under the Companies Act. So it will become a private company, and the PIA says this will happen in six months. At first, um, it will be equally owned by the Ministry of Petroleum and the Ministry of Finance. Subsequently, the idea is that, uh, based on agreement with the government and approvals, its ownership will be open to the public. This could be either through privatization, through a bid process, there has been no specific mention of an IPO, uh, uh, initial public offering. That would be nice. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because it means every Nigerian could can, own, own a share. can own a share yeah. in Any. their national, you know, that, that would be fantastic. Mm. What are the opportunities for lawyers in this, well, I don't know. Yeah, in the space? In the space, yeah. What, well, any new opportunities? I, I think it's an extension of already existing. Um, but I'll give you an example. Before the PIA became law, clients were paying me to analyze it. Going forward. We're going to see a lot more of that. As a given. Mm -hmm. So every energy, oil and gas lawyer, even those that are not oil and gas lawyers, are going to have clients saying, what does the PIB mean? Right? Some might try and get it for free, but uh, I advise you to charge for it if you're a lawyer. <laughs> right? So there are going to be opportunities there. But then, um, remember what I said about infrastructure development because of the gas. Right? I think, no, I, I, I actually believe that you're going to see in the next three to five years a marked improvement in infrastructure development. And a firm like Templars can handle all of it, or even the big ones or the medium ones. There's going to be a plethora of work that is going to be spread around mm. because of the PIA and so many projects coming on. So I'm, I'm not saying every uh, lawyer has uh, found their golden fleece, uh, but if there's anything that's going to generate more work, it's going to be the PIA.
Now, away from that interview, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanko Mohammed, has administered the oath of office on the newly appointed Chief Judge of the Federal Capital Territory, Justice Yusuf Baba, and five caddies of the FCT Sharia Court of Appeal. The CJN also urged the newly sworn in judges to be impartial and rise above primordial sentiments in the discharge of their duty. Throughout your tenure, as the head of the FCT Judiciary and cadres of the FCT Sharia Court of Appeal, you must endeavor to be impartial, fair to all, and apply justice and equity in all your undertakings. You are expected to conduct your affairs within the ambit of the law and the oath that has just been administered on you. Anything to the contrary will not place you on the right side of history. You must resolutely rise and operate above every primordial sentiment that might blight you are tenuous. Respect yourselves, respect the persons you work with, and stand always by the truth. If you do so, God is there to guide you, God is there to protect you, and I am sure Sakai will be the starting point of your journey. In River State, Governor Yesom Wike has signed into law the bill on value-added tax collection in the state. At the signing in ceremony, the governor said that the judgment of the Federal High Court sitting in Port Harcourt has sufficiently addressed the illegality perpetrated by the Federal Inland Revenue Service, FIRS, on behalf of the federal government in the collection of VAT in states. Members of the River State Executive Council and legislators of the State House of Assembly are gathered here to witness the signing into law of the five bills recently passed by the State House of Assembly. The bills are the Value Added Tax Law No. 4 of 2021, which empowers the state government to collect value added tax in line with a recent judgment by a federal high court in Port Hackett. The Open Rearing and Grazing Prohibition Law No. 5 of 2021, in line with the Asaba Declaration of the Southern Governors and the Child's Right Amendment Law No. 2 of 2021. The bills empowering the River State Government to name and rename infrastructure in the state in honor of notable persons and establish an agency to register citizens and residents of the state, as well as those visiting River State, were also presented for assent by the leader of the River State House of Assembly, Martin Awehule. Governor Wike, flanked by the Speaker of the State House of Assembly and the State Attorney General, proceeds to sign the bills into law. He says the new laws are necessary to solve specific challenges, including the practice of true federalism in tax collection and protection of lives and properties. First of all, the issue is who is responsible or whose duty it is to collect that. that is, let's talk about the constitutionality of it first. What you are doing has nothing to do with party. It does not matter whether you are APC or you are PDP. By the grace of God, the greatest beneficiary of this will be APC states, like Lagos, like Ogun State. But, of course, we shouldn't say because they are going to benefit more. But what is the law? We must obey what the law says. If the law says, do this, this is the person that has to do this, let them allow the person to do it. So there is no blackmail that can change us. There is no intimidation, I hear. Oh, they are going to make sure they reverse it. That is not our business. We are not doing it because we want to win. We are doing it because what is not legal is not uh, legal. And somebody has to rise to the occasion to challenge the illegalities in this country. Once more, on behalf of the 
is it the council? Let me thank the speaker again and his team for a job well done and say that the synergy between the legislature and the executive is for the interest of our state. It is not for anybody's particular uh, 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 interest. It is for the general interest of the people of the state. We took this step today to sign these various laws. Let people know. We are not doing it in secret. We are doing it openly. Let Nigerians know that this is our position and this is where we stand. We always believe in standing on the side of uh, history. And where history will be written tomorrow, we will not regret all the actions that we took today. And just before we go, let's bring you a recap of some of the legal stories that made the headline. We begin with the report that the 36 states of the country have filed a suit at the Supreme Court against the federal government on the status of recovered funds and failure to remit same to the Federation account. Through their attorneys general, who are listed as plaintiffs in the suit, the 36 states instituted the action against the office of the Attorney General of the Federation seeking a declaration that by the provisions of 162 subsection 1 and section 162 subsection 10 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as amended, all income, returns, proceeds or receipts derived from confiscated, forfeited and or recovered assets constitute revenue which must be remitted to the Federation account for the collective benefit of the federal, state and local governments. Amongst other things, the plaintiffs are also seeking a declaration that the failure and or refusal of President Muhammadu Buhari, the Minister of Finance, the Office of the Attorney General of the Federation and the Accountant General of the Federation and all her relevant authorities and all agencies of the Federation to remit the returns or proceeds derived from all assets recovered, seized, confiscated and forfeited into the Federation account to be distributed in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution is unconstitutional. The Supreme Court is yet to give a date for the hearing of the suit. The Minister of Labour and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngege, has approached the Industrial Court for Adjudication in the trade dispute between the federal government and the National Association of Resident Doctors. The federal government is asking the court to order the resident doctors who've been on strike in the last two weeks to return to their duty posts as reconciliation talks are ongoing. The Industrial Court in Abuja has adjourned ruling on the matter to September the 15th. In Imo State, a state high court sitting in Oweri has reaffirmed Judo Keke as the authentic national chairman of the All Progressives Grand Alliance, APCA, and directed the Independent National Electoral Commission to recognize all correspondence from his faction for the November governorship election in Anambra State. This ruling followed an application of stay of execution and leave to appeal filed by the Victor Oye led APCA in his earlier judgment on the matter. Justice Vivian Isiguzo granted Victoria leave to appeal the judgment but refused to grant the prayer on stay of execution. Rather, she reaffirmed the earlier judgment on the matter which ruled that Judo KK be recognized as the authentic national chairman of APCA and his correspondence relating to the electoral processes for the forthcoming governorship election be recognized. In Akwaibom State, the trial of the confessed killer of Miss Enubonga Morin a graduate job seeker continued at State High Court in Uyo amidst heavy security presence. The stern-looking security operatives also prevented the media from taking pictures or visuals of the accused. 21-year-old Udwa Kabasi Frank Akman is being prosecuted in a three-count charge bordering on rape and murder of a graduate job seeker. Udwa Kabasi Frank Akman is facing a two-count charge of murder and rape punishable under Section 326, Subsection 1 of the Criminal Code Cap 38, Volume 2, Laws of Aquaibom State, 2000. Hidela pleaded guilty to murder, but pleaded not guilty for rape. The prosecution has called its first witness in the case, Miss Ifyok Omurin, the sister to the murdered job seeker. Owing to the court's annual vacation, Justice Bennett Ita Umor adjourned to November for continuation of trial. And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shola Shele. Thank you for watching and see you next time.